I might sort of nick this intentionally or unintentionally, so I thought I need to kind of not read that. Um, and I think you just have to know in yourself what's helpful or what's going to be too influential, because if something's brilliant, you either go, oh, God, I can't do that as well, or I'm going to nick it all. And I don't, you know, it's the, not that you would do that, but the, it, you, you don't want to be too influenced by someone, I think. Sure. I wondered, we talked a little bit about the generation of ideas, and I'm wondering about the difference in that process between commissioned work and work that you're doing on spec. So when a project is your baby and it's there from the start, is there a different process which then kicks in to when actually you're being approached by a producer or a director? I think I've, uh, I've always got that stuff that's just mine that I'm always kind of working on. So when there's time, so that's what I was doing yesterday afternoon that was terrible, was something I'm working on my own. And, and I suppose it's just keeping that alive when you're doing your commission scripts. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think there's, I always have stuff in different f stages of, of readiness and, you know, something you could go, I've got an idea to a page, to a Bible. I mean, there's always stuff going on. So I like to have things I could sort of go, and this, you know, if you meet someone who maybe would be interested in it. Um, so I've always got a, a book with lots of usually useless ideas in, but, you know, sure. yeah. Nadia, Peter, I mean, how about you? I mean, I wonder how much also there's an interplay between the two. I mean, if there's a commissioned idea which comes in, are you tempted sometimes to take, if there's been a, a pet project that's been sitting there for possibly years, are you tempted to use that as a resource for a commissioned work and actually take an idea, a motif from that? I've only kind of ever done what I want, you know, what I want to do. Um, I think, though, that perhaps that, in hindsight, that was a negative, perhaps if I'd done more commissioned work, I think I would be better as a writer. I think I would be more seasoned. I would have, I would have had more experience. I would have had more sort of, um, you know, training, as it were. Um, but I've only kind of only ever done what I want, so I don't know about sort of a commission. I, even if it's a book, I'm, I'm doing a book now, but it, I found it, and I, we went and got, myself and my producer went and got it. So, But it's interesting to work with a, a writer of a book. And I've been very lucky that I have a great relationship with the person who wrote the book. And I imagine that it would be very, very difficult if you didn't have that relationship, because there would be a war of ideas. So I'm, I'm just touch wood and pray. I find that, actually, I find that a really difficult question to answer, because, you know, especially as I've been doing a bit of producing and directing recently, and I, actually, I'm on the other side of the fence a little bit, in that, you know, um, uh, you will generate ideas for development, and then you'll kind of, like, actually... Um, it sounds horrible, but cast the right or bring writers in and, and, and get a sense of what their what the response is. And it's a, it's a, I find that a fascinating process because it's sort of like an idea that has started with, with, with you or with a conversation um, that you've had with another producer or a development executive or whatever. And then, but it's not your idea. It's got to become, you've got to allow it to go and you've got to let a writer inhabit it completely um, and make it her or his own. Um, and... Uh, and that process, um, how that happens, is, is fascinating because I think the ideal thing is that there shouldn't feel as though there's any difference between a commissioned or an original piece of work. Mm -hmm. You know, it really, really shouldn't. You should get to a point, if the process is good, where there's, you know, there's no question that, that, that the writer um, feels this is something, not that it's like something that they're making because it's a gig and that there's some money involved, but that they can invest everything that they are as a writer in, in this material. Um, and that's certainly how I felt, you know, coming back to me being on the more writing directing side with McQueen, um, you know, it was a project that, uh, that sort of came out of a series of conversations really, um, and which weren't started by either me or my fellow director, um, Ian Bonnot. Um, we sort of like came onto it. Um, but at the end, it was, you know, felt absolutely as though it was our baby. I mean, for people who aren't aware, obviously, Nadia and Peter are directors as well. Charlie is a, a pure scriptwriter, I suppose. That's a good way of putting it. I mean, I wonder, do you feel that, without wishing to be prying, I mean, I wondered if you feel that writing is a, a route into directing? Or... It's pretty shit. Fuck off. Working all day with my mind on fire I can't stop thinking of you I kind of think I could fall in love with him. I thought she could be interesting to kill, so I pretended to fall in love with her. Walking all day with my feet this is nice. What is? I thought probably he was gay. He does prick. Let's leave this shithole town. I'm going whether you come with me or not. You in? 
I didn't know where we were going or when I was going to kill her. I punched my dad in the face and stole his car, and that felt like a good place to start. We can literally do anything. Do you want to go on a date? I will have a banana split and an extra fucking spoon. Sorry, that's it, right? Marvin! Oh, yeah, see if Marvin can make a banana split for me, you fucking... Bye, Marvin! Seemed that Alyssa had some issues. Keep on I feel safe with James. Keep on being with Alyssa had started to make me feel things. I didn't like it at all. Have you ever eaten a pussy before? Mm. A lot of the time, you don't register the important moments as they happen. You only see that they were important when you look back. Seatbelts. Fuck seatbelts. Take your top off. I think I'm stuck. Do you think it's going to explode? It's not a film. I might be able to fix it. We can't just leave it here. I do you reckon you can still fix it? Why is no one stopping? Probably because you've got your tits out. No one stops the weirdos except other weirdos. Do you want to lift? Come on. I am going to be so fucked off if we get murdered. Oh, Come on, baby! I told you it was the So on a really nuts and bolts level, on a very sort of prosaic level, I mean, let's talk about the difference between TV and film. Obviously, this is an, okay. it's an episodic work, so I suppose yeah, before yeah. we get into the tone of the thing, I mean, that idea of the project is something which was always going to have a lot of screen time, and there was going to mm. be an arc, and there was going to be mm. there was going to be a complexity to it. How did you set about that process about telling this this long story? Well, one thing I would say is the director John Entwistle, who made the short that um, kind of got this commission, was that. Uh, I mean, if you watch it, it's basically a long film. Yes, it's portioned up into eight bits of between 17 and 20 minutes, which we were worried about in terms of length, but we got away with it. Um, we always treated it like a long feature that we spliced up, um, which I think is quite... It was quite a helpful way to write it, because even though you, were, you, know, you have to think of your end of parts and your end of episodes and the hooks, it was essentially a feature-length thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of the, the kind of nuts and bolts of it, I wrote a pilot in 2015 uh, in the summer, and then we got a green light at the end of the year. Um, I was then writing in earnest, but I was also writing on a couple of other things, so it was a bit manic. Um, and then I think mercifully, at the time it was, you know, tricky, but we got pushed by six months. Um, uh, so we were ready to, we were going to be filming in the summer of 2016. Um, and then I think Channel 4 decided that actually there was no point rushing through. They had lots of other things that they were doing. Um, so I got another six months to write, which was a godsend. And looking back, I think the scripts that I would have handed in to film, I don't think they were as good. So I'm now very relieved that we had that extra time. I mean, for people who don't know Charlie's background, you were, you were an actor originally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I wondered both practically uh, a little bit about that route from acting into, into writing and also then how that informs your writing, I suppose particularly with The End of the Fucking World. It feels like something where there is a, a kind of very real connection between the script and the actors. How much of that is to do with your own background? Um, well, the route... Do you want to say the route in yeah, first? Yeah, why, why So I did this... Um, I, I got very lucky. I got given a job working on Banana, which was Russell T. Davis's series that was a companion piece to Cucumber on Channel 4. And in the meeting, the producer happened to be the producer of Misfits, and I had appeared very briefly in season four of that. And he was like, oh, you know, I didn't know you were writing. And then they kind of casually said, Russell and Nicola Schindler said, maybe you'd like to be in whatever you, you write. And I was like, well, yeah, I'll see. I wrote myself apart. And then, um, uh, and then said, yeah, yeah, I'll be up for it. So, um, and I think I, I didn't realise how unusual that was. I mean, they, they were so generous and trusting, and they said, yeah, write something and, you know, do it yourself. Um, so the first kind of TV job I got, I was performing it. And so I think being able to do those two things side by side was really useful because now 
because um, the worst thing is an actor, I don't know if any of you act, but you know, if you have a script and the writer's very rigid and doesn't let you change a line that just isn't working, um, and sometimes you cast an actor and actually you need to shift the dialogue a little bit just to make it work for that particular actor, or an actor might have a better idea. Um, certainly on the day I was thinking of stuff that would work better and would want, would want to change it. And so I think if you can have that attitude to people who are performing it, I mean, not to be a doormat and go, yeah, change what you want, improvise it, but, um, but to have that flexibility I have found quite helpful and it means you are more collaborative from the word go. And I think, from my experience, the best things I've been involved with have been the ones that are the most collaborative. There's a very particular tone to the piece, and I wondered how much that was to do with sort of almost a sense of confidence. You know, it's, it feels like the kind of work that you could only write if you felt very sure that you were hitting the mark. I think, I mean, the, the source material is brilliant. So it's based on a graphic novel, and it is just a, it's a wonderful graphic novel. It's quite sparse, so, you know, there was a lot to, there's a lot of difference, I suppose, in the adaptation. Um, but uh, I think the director... John had a really strong idea of how he wanted it to look, and we had Justin Brown as our DOP, who was just brilliant, um, recently Emmy nominate, nominated for the show. And um, so there was, a, there was a real confidence with how it was going to look, and the, the, the source material is, is kind of confident and unashamedly um, angry, and, and kind of, but there's a lot of heart there. So I think if you take the essence of that, I felt really safe within those two kind of boundaries, like what I was basing it on and how it was going to be executed. So actually, I felt very, very kind of safe in that space. So I could be quite confident, I think. I mean, I wanted to ask you, but I wanted to ask all three of you, in fact, who at that stage of the, of the writing process, if anyone, you're consulting with and you're using as a sounding board, because obviously there will be people professionally who will <coughs> be then involved in the creative process. But mm. I wonder before then, is there a friend, a neighbour, a family member, is there someone that you're using to just bounce ideas off and just try things out on? Or is it simply you and the MacBook at that stage? I'll ask you first, Charlie, but then I'd, I'd like another. Um, my, my partner is great. Um, my dad is great. My dad likes to read everything and then see what it's like. My mum doesn't want to read anything. She just wants to see the end result. Um, she's lazy. Uh, <laughs> no. but she, and she said, oh, you don't mind, do you? I was like, no, I like the fact that you, but you have a different attitude towards it. And, and, and my agent is brilliant. So I always send my agent the very first draft before it should be seen by anyone. And she's really helpful with notes. So they're my three, probably. Okay. Peter, how about you? Uh, it depends on the project, really. Um, but, I mean, I, I'm very lucky in that my partner's um, a therapist, and so I can, I can run by <laughs> lucky in psychological... So many uh, if, if there are, you know, um, for example, you know, just dealing with understanding um, the project that we've just been working on, the McQueen film, you know, understanding McQueen and talking... And, and, and you have to take seriously, obviously, when you're doing it, whether it's drama or documentary, if, if you have a character who is going to um, commit suicide, you, you know, that takes you into an area that you know, might know nothing about. And you have to be both very sensitive and also both you know, really try and understand the state of mind and what's going on and the reactions of you know, the sensitivities of everyone around that person. You know, so, um, I, I, and, um, and Tessa, my, my wife, was, you know, was just absolutely, if we'd go for these long walks and spend hours just talking about, uh, about um, uh, about that particularly, um, and about some other issues that kind of came out of his life. Um, uh, before that, I'd made another feature doc about Marlon Brando and working with a director, um, Stephen Riley. And again, actually, we, we would just go for these very, very long walks, um, mainly on Wimbledon Common, um, trying to figure Brando out, which was, you know, a difficult thing to do. And that was before we got anywhere close to it. So it's, it's I kind of find either your partner or your key collaborator, those become my, my, my main go-tos. Sure. Nadia, I mean, you were talking about the fact that, you know, your ideas are, are your own and you generate them, and Thebe is a film which was, was yours. I mean, at what stage, well... Well, no, Thebe is co-written. Okay. The, orig the original idea comes from uh, Basil Bandor, who, who I wrote the film with. And I like to write with, with people, so also this film is being, uh, my new film is being uh, co-written with my producer, Rupert Lloyd, who I've done everything with. And so I love that kind of back and forth. And obviously, the, the huge amount of the film was written with the, with the Bedouin. Um, most of the dialogue came, I mean, it's in their language, so <clears throat> the dialogue had to come from them. Mm -hmm. um, and it was kind of workshop with them. So there's this mixture between sort of very collaborative um, experience, and then also I like to then go into a cave, you know, and sit by myself and 
and do the writing and then come out again and share it with the co-writer. So there's this kind of back and forth process between something that's very sort of isolationist and very collaborative. And that's, what, how, that's how I like, I like to go back and forth between the two. Right, that's, that's interesting. So the writing partnership is not the two of you sitting side by side continually swapping ideas. There's a process. I mean, there's a bit of that, but there's also a process of going off and then coming back together and sharing ideas after time apart. Yeah, so usually there's the concept and there's a, a research and sort of development phase where it's just in conversations and travel and research and all this kind of stuff. Then it's a period of um, uh, sort of brainstorming together. Then I'm alone in a room. I write you know, a scene or a draft. I come out. I show it to the co-writer. They, they have their go. Maybe they'll write a scene and it will go back and forth like that. But yeah, it kind of it go, it goes back and forth. I think maybe we should take a look at a clip from Thebe. It's a, again, it's a remarkable piece of writing. Um, it's, kind of, it, it's rooted in history. It's also very moving. Um, there's, a, there's a real sense of humanity mm -hmm. to it. Let's have a, a look at the film and then, again, pick up the conversation. من يغوص البحر الأحمر فلا يلحق مداه والبحر يذيب ما كل رجل يعصره والخوي لا من بدالك لا تخيب له رجعة كون يمه في يمينه بل مراجل واصلة وذيابه لو بدت ما تحقق لك نجاه كلهم ما ينفعونك والمنايا حاصله It's a very powerful film. If you haven't seen it, please do go and seek it out. I mean, I wonder, um, with a historical story like this, how easy it is to, to, to not get lost in the detail. I mean, you know, actually, whether it's a screenplay or whether it's a novel, what writers of historical pieces often say is that they, be, they can become, they fall in love so much with the history and so much with the, the detail that it then becomes quite difficult to translate that into a story for a wider audience. I always get completely lost in the detail. Um, and it used to drive me insane. And I've just done it again. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm beginning to realize that that's just part of the process, and I have to accept that that is going to be part of the process. So when I come up with an idea or I find a project or whatever the case may be, I have to do all the research. I, I, it's, it's what I love doing. And if I can, I like to go to the place or, or interact with the material as much as I can. That then leads to confusion because you're, it's an information overload. And there's a period of time where you just kind of have to settle with your thoughts, because there's another reason why you're making the film. And that, for me, is some kind of subconscious need, almost like therapy, to work through something that I don't understand what that is. But I know there's a kind of um, an obsession or a need to go through that. And so your, 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 your subconscious or your mind then begins to try and marry the two processes, the, the, the heavy, the detail of all that information overload and what's happening for you personally as a human being and what you, uh, you, 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 what, the reason why you're making this film. And I never know why pretty much until the end or after um, the process. And that's why I love doing it, because I love the discoveries that come along with that process. But it's tricky, isn't it? Because I guess on one level, you know, what, whatever it is that has obsessed you about a period or about a certain kind of story, you know, it will have given you this great thirst of information. And then it's difficult for, for anyone in any context to know quite what, you know, you fall in love with every new piece of information. And it's difficult not to just splurge at people and not to try and just tell everyone everything. Which is, which is what I do. And that's why I'm very lucky that I have a producer I've known my whole life, because most other producers would fire me. They would just go, this is <laughs> ridiculous. And also, you know, the company we, we, we picked to, to work with, I'm not, I can't really talk about the, you know, all that kind of stuff, but we specifically chose those people because they would give us 
the freedom and the and 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 the and have the understanding to allow me to do that and 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 realize that they don't need to be worried or scared that that's just part of the process that I'm going through um, in developing the film. So you you have to be strategic about picking who you work with and um, if you're going to follow that process. It doesn't work in other situations, which I've found out as well. <laughs> <laughs> I may dig into it later. I mean, one of the things I really liked about Steve was the way that you you kind of used genre. You know, you, there, were, there were traces of Western and traces of coming in and out of age there, but it also felt like a film very much with its own identity. Tell us a little bit about your approach to genre, because you felt, you felt, it felt like you were using it for the best of genre, which was the strength of genre, without becoming sort of tethered to it. Again, so it, when, I, when I find an idea for a project, there'll be the... The, the, the personal subconscious excitement, there'll be the research of the actual story, the history, the, the, the detail, the research and development that comes into the subject matter and the character and whatever that is. And then there's the genre and the film cinematic traditions that are involved. And I splurge on all of them in that opening phase. I watch every film related to the genre, usually rewatching because I already know that, that you know, I'm, they're usually genres that I love. Um, uh, so I, I, but I kind of do a little degree in that genre again, and then I drop it all, and I don't think about it, and I don't rewatch it, and I let the, I let my sort of the subconscious of all this information slowly develop. And at the beginning, you get stuck, and you feel very frustrated, and you don't know what to do, and you're lost. And then slowly but surely, you start. I call it like it all flows in the same stream. And that's what you're doing. You've got all these balls up in the air, and you're just trying to get everything in the same streams that all flows together. And you know, with Eve, there was stuff in post-production that was that was coming in that were key elements of the story, like the poem in the beginning of the film, that were coming in while I was doing post-production. So it really is a journey of discovery, um, and you just need to trust that if you do that work, eventually going through sorry, eventually going through the process, you'll get there. Again, it was a question I wanted to ask all three of you. I wondered how, to what extent you feel that a, a screenwriter can have a signature, a per, an obvious personality of their own. I mean, we associate novelists, and to an extent with film, we associate directors with having obsessions and motifs that they keep returning to. As screenwriters, can you do the same thing? Can you, can you bring out your own personality and so that there is, there is a trace of you in every project? Um, I think, at the moment, TV is the writer's medium. Like, if you look at showrunners, like Vince Gilligan or um, Genji Cohen or Jill Soloway, I think the authorship is more likely at the moment to be on on TV. Mm -hmm. But um, but I don't know. I mean, I, I think I was really lucky on End of the Fucking World because Clark and Well, they're really generous and they basically they sort of treated me like a producer in the edit, and we'd all watched cuts and you know lots of the music was kind of joint decisions and we had this amazing supervisor but lots of people fed in and they were they're a really generous bunch um so i think they allowed it to feel authored but as i say as well because from the beginning there'd been this short film made there was this great material i think this project is an unusual one in that there was such a strong sense of what it was um and so in you know when i went for the interview i watched the short i'd read the book and you kind of made your pitch for what you would do with it and i think I guess I fitted in with, with their vision for it. So it felt like, um, certainly within the creative team, there wasn't much kind of butting of heads with some, you know, some of the uh, uh, conversations we had with broadcasters. There was occasionally kind of friction there, but actually with the team itself, and that's always the case, but we were fairly united, I think, so. Now, Jim Peter, how do you feel? I mean, as writer directors, I mean, you, I mean, Peter, you mentioned reading scripts. I mean, can you, can you if you're reading, two or three works by the same scriptwriter. Can you see something, a common thread there? Yeah, you, yeah, I mean, I think it's easier because in a sense, from my own point of view, because I write screenplays less these days, um, per se, I mean, even if I'm writing a documentary, it's not a script in the sense that, that a, a dramatized script is. Um, uh, I think that I don't, I couldn't really tell you that. From my, I mean, I know that when I'm, when I'm working on anything, you bring your whole sensibility to it. You bring all the tools of the trade that you've learned. You, you, you bring what you like to see in the cinema yourself to what you're doing. So to that extent, but then I think totally agree with what Charlie's saying. It's, you know, it's a very collaborative medium and hopefully everyone's working in unison and, um, and it all flows, the stream flows um, correctly. But 
I, I've been working on this series for Radio 4 recently called Unmade Movies. And, it, it, and for that show, basically what we've been doing is we've been trying to find great unproduced screenplays in the vaults of the BFI archive or any other archive, and then bring them to life um, for, for radio. And it, it really struck me, because I, I read, for example, I read, a, I read a dozen unmade scripts by Stanley Kubrick, uh, a, a, a dozen, 20 scripts by, by, uh, by Dennis Potter. And we've just done a Dennis Potter, actually. It was on last weekend. And, um, and it was amazing reading a lot of Dennis Potter uh, because I, you know, I could see him so clearly in the script. You can see it in the finished, in the finished Dennis Potter show, but somehow in the script you could feel just the way that he would phrase something or his music choices or you know, the way he would describe a character um, was so utterly him. Um, so you really sort of got to know the voice. And that, that's, that was very interesting to see. I hadn't, I hadn't sort of felt that so much before. Sure. Najee, how about you? I mean, it's, it's, it's TV a writer's medium or is film a writer's medium as well? Or is film a filmmaker's I, th I, well, I think it's, I mean, certainly for me, because, I, because I'm involved in, from the concept to the, the end, it's very much, um, and I think the writing is, is a voice um, that is kind of, I mean, you, when you're talking about the development of a character and all that, all that kind of thing. So yeah, I definitely think it's a, a writer's medium. I know for me that it's very personal. Um, I don't know if the audience or the critics will will see the connection, but I know why. I know there's a theme running through my films that that's just personal to me, and that I won't necessarily share with the with the world. Um, which makes me scared because the next film's really dark, so <laughs> 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 everyone's going to think I'm a psychopath. Um, but yeah, then definitely it's personal, and, and, and there is a unique voice there. We've talked a little bit about, about McQueen, um, which is Peter's most recent film. Um, I want to show a clip from that. Uh, again, please do go and see it out if you haven't seen it already. It's the documentary portrait of the great British, late great British fashion designer Alexander McQueen. There's lots of people who say, I discovered McQueen. No one discovered Alexander McQueen. Alexander McQueen discovered himself. I wasn't very good at school. I was always drawing clothes. He was a very happy child. He was passionate. When Lee was 17, he said, I'll make you a couple of skirts. I've got to say, they fit like a glove. He was drawing from all of these influences. Jack the Ripper stalks his victims. In the early years, Lee had seen violent things. The darkness created genius. Nobody could create emotions like McQueen. You might find him distasteful, shocking, or misogynistic. He made every single headline. I don't want to do a show feeling like you've just had Sunday lunch. I want you to feel repulsed or exhilarated. Going to the depths of one's mind, you start losing who you are, and it becomes a place that you can't get out of. Family keep me grounded in a very superficial business. He thought the whole system was against him. His vision was so extraordinary. This genius. I saw myself within the public eye as the gazelle, and the gazelle always got eaten. We can all be discarded quite easily. You're there, you're gone. <laughs> It's a jungle out there. I mean, Nadi was talking with Thebe about that, that sense of getting lost in historical research. I mean, McQueen is obviously a much more recent story, but again, there is presumably a very long period of research, an intense period of research. How easy is it to translate that, that, that kind of fascination of finding out about this character in this case? How easy is it to translate that into, again, what is a very concise piece of storytelling? Um, well, you start with the concision, actually. In, in that case, um, uh, I had read a little bit about him, I'd watched a bit about him, and I didn't want to, I knew I was going to go into that, get lost in research. I knew that was going to happen, and I, I'm, I found that very terrifying. So I kind of like thought, okay, how, if, if I wasn't allowed to do any of that research, how would I, how would I set that story down? And, um, and I already had a very strong sense that McQueen, he wanted to express himself through his shows. So 
the simple structure really was to, to, to make a film that was kind of five acts um, and, five, um, and five shows were at the center of it and then, and then use those as anchors through which to express his journey. Um, so that came very quickly. And in fact, um, having discussed it with, um, with my fellow director, uh, we, I then wrote that. Um, I wrote a 10-page treatment, very much as I would for, uh, for any other kind of film. Um, uh, and then I really got done to doing all the research. With nonfiction, I wonder, do you find it easier or is it more straightforward for people, you think, to, to tell a story that they have arrived at from a place of great passion, so a story that they have long wanted to tell? Or is it actually easier in some ways to come to a, a character or a series of events, to come to them new and to actually approach them as, as, as a new story to you and then you almost become, you become the eventual audience because you are freshly picking out what is interesting and engaging? I, I mean, this is just me, but I always think of myself, when, whenever I'm doing anything, I try to put myself in imagine what it was going to be like to see that film or to see the trailer of that film even to sort of like what 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 emotions is that going to arouse in me and what what do i find tantalizing about that story um so that has to be the starting point because you have you know in a sense when you're making a film particularly a cinema film i mean i think any film actually uh, false distinction you're you're making it for the audience you want to give them a narrative experience that takes them on a journey and obviously it's a journey that's related to your own sort of on some level to your own interests obsessions sensitivities um uh you know but you really want to give them an experience and so you're thinking you'll think and if if you can't sell that to yourself then you shouldn't be doing it because it's you know it's just not going to Play. I, I was going to ask because I suppose the process of, of scripting documentaries, there is a parallel with journalism and my background is journalism and with journalism the task is always to find the angle because otherwise what you end up doing is Wikipedia, essentially you end up certainly with a true life story just recounting a series of events in sort of chronological order. So with McQueen as an example, I mean how did you go about kind of finding your angle? Um... I think there were, there, were, there were two things with McQueen that were, were particularly interesting from the get-go. Uh, one was how, was this, was, was this story of somebody who came, I mean, the rags to riches thing with McQueen can be overdone, but somebody who comes from a, a, a East End working class family that has, is as far removed from the world of fashion as you can imagine. How does he get from there to the very pinnacle of that industry? I mean, that was a, a, a kind of a... To me, that was like a th almost like a thriller story. It was mm -hmm. what happened? What, how did that? How did that happen? Um, and then I suppose the other question, sort of for the other end of the film, was why, uh, when he is, you know, he's at the height of his powers, does he decide to end it all? What? Why did that happen? Uh, and um, uh, and so those two questions really, you know, defined in, in a sense the, the the approach to telling his story. Um, but it's interesting you should talk about talk about the journalistic act because I've got no background in journalism. So my background is very much, you know, through dra dramatized film, whether it's non-fiction source material or or, uh, um, or, or fiction, um, it's adaptation. And in, in, to an extent, I sort of regard documentary as as part of, as part of a branch of adaptation. Um, in a sense, and that you're still having to think about the audience. And See, this is interesting, yes, because I wonder, so it's almost, when you talk about McQueen, it's almost the idea of he is the character, and it could almost be, you're being, yeah. you're obviously, you're, you're not misrepresenting him on screen, uh, you're being no. faithful to what happened, but you're almost taking him as a character, and then the character is part of a narrative, in the same way it would be with fiction. Absolutely, and not just McQueen, you're also thinking, I mean, from my point of view, I'm also thinking about the, in documentary, we, uh, we call them contributors, um, but I think of them very much as characters, so when you go out and, uh, and, uh, do an interview with someone, um, to me, it's not about getting information out of them. It's about getting the, in a way, the emotional beats of the, their story. And they're, so they become like secondary characters to the main protagonist, in this case, is obviously McQueen. Um, so, uh, so you're trying to think, what that means is you're trying to think of, about them almost as, you know, give them a kind of a three-act structure, sort of how do they come into the story, why do they come into it, what's the development of their story in relation to the main protagonist, uh, and what to an extent, as I'm sort of put it like this, but the kind of the payoff, the third act um, to that. Um, and you can't do that with everyone, but you identify who your main cast is, and, and you work with them sort of in that way. I hope that doesn't sound too exploitative or, 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 or glib on, on my part. I don't think anyone would take it that way. No. I mean, we spoke a little bit about the collaborations, the early collaborations that happen early in the creative process, whether that's showing something to a, to a partner or a family member. But obviously later in the process, when the project is actually rolling, um, 
film, as everyone in the room will know, is an in, in, inherently collaborative process. Um, and it's interesting, again, we've got a writer and then writer-directors, or will soon be a writer-director. I wondered physically how you feel about the presence of writers on set. I mean, that's obviously for you two, that's a, an interesting question to answer because you are writer and filmmaker at the same time. But Not do you think, yeah, I mean, well, when, in that case, when, when there is a separation of roles, is it useful for the writer to be on set, do you think? And actually, is it also useful for the rest of the filmmaking team to have the writer there? Or should there be a separation once the script has been finalised? I think it depends on personalities, actually. I think, um, I think some directors want to go, right, you've done your job and now I'm going to do mine. Some writers actively don't want to be involved. They're very happy to hand it over. Some writers are far too controlling and need to be banned from the set because you can't, you know, you can't do that if you're, if you're going to be sort of obstructive about a part of the process that isn't yours. So I think it depends on who, you know, I've, I've been really lucky in that, so I did a film called Burn, 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 a friend of mine, Chanya, she directed it and we kind of, we came up with the idea together and then I wrote the script and she directed it, but she was, you know, really generous, let me come on set, which I assume means that I wasn't a massive pain in the arse or she was just, you know, really polite. But I think, um, I think it depends, yeah, the dynamics. And again, like if you're going to, if the director's happy for actors to do a take where they might tweak a line mm -hmm. and the writer's going to go, absolutely not, what are you doing? Then they probably shouldn't be on set in that process. So I, I feel like, yeah, it probably is something that comes organically depending on the project and the personalities involved. Peter and Argy, as writer-directors. Well, I, 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 I mean, when I started in the business, I, I was working in the art department and then in the cutting room, and I loved the process of being close to the making of films. And then I went to this long period where I was a writer, writer, and um, I used to hate the fact that I was like a stranger when 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 something actually got moving and yeah and you, you know your script or a version of your script was being <laughs> was being made that that you had no role you had no sort of involvement and I think that sort of um, changed for me very much when I started working in it, it, again in well came to documentary because in documentary the kind of there's very little, you know, there's only four or five of you involved with really making the, the film on the, on, on the front line. And you're all together all the time. And all the different bits of the process are happening sort of more or less simultaneously. Um, you know, you're cutting at the same time as you're shooting, at the same time as you're sort of like writing sequences, as, you know, it, it, which I love. I love that sort of immediacy about it. It's, it's uh, and that sort of, the you, as you talked about chaos before, and it's, mm. it's right. But it's actually a chaos that is that, that's incredibly creative and, and 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 fun. So I kind of feel I found a home within that. Sure. Now, G, how about you? Um, two things. I mean, I like to bring on the key heads of the department what in the writing phase, because I want them to contribute to the screenplay, and they often do contribute amazing things to the screenplay. So um, at some point before I begin pre-production on the film, as in as I'm still writing, I'm going to start. You know, I'm still doing my list of who I want to work with, but when I get those people, I'll involve them and I'll change the script with them. The second thing is, because we were doing such a low-budget film um, and it was a journey film, I often had to merge scenes and rewrite scenes at night after the shooting day so the film would survive, because otherwise we, we, we didn't have enough money to, to reshoot or anything, so we, I would just have to, like, OK, I've got these four scenes and they somehow need to become one at 3 o'clock in the morning after... So it's very difficult. And to the directors out there, the key thing about that process, whether you know, you're the writer or you have a writer, if that work is being done, you need a very, very close relationship with your first AD. I had a wonderful first AD. He knew that when I said I'm merging scenes 70 to 74, exactly what those scenes were. And, and we could talk on that level of, OK, 70, 74 are together, we're doing this. And he knew what I was talking about immediately. Wow. You need that to survive a low-budget film and produce the work that you want to produce. You have to have people fully invested with you and that know everything. So it's very important. I want to throw to you guys in a second, but just quickly before we do that, I mean, one last question for everybody, which is obviously, hopefully, this wouldn't happen certainly too many times over the course of a career. But if you find yourself as a writer or a director, in fact, if you do find yourself in a position where there are other forces in the film, and potentially you know, a level of seniority, who have a different vision for, for the work, how do you manage that? I mean, how do you manage to actually, you know, on the one hand, maintain the professional relationship, but on the other hand, see your vision, hopefully, to fruition? Oh, it's really difficult. Um, I don't... 
I think you have to pick your battles and I think you have to be realistic about the stage you're at in your career. So, of course, you know, you, you can be really stubborn about something that you think is, is right. But actually, if you're, and hopefully you would always be working with people who you respect and you trust. I mean, on the end of the fucking world, the only time I, we really disagreed about something in the team, I do concede I was wrong, but I was absolutely convinced I was right at the time. And they were very patient. But they allowed me to kind of say how I felt and then said, no, but you're wrong. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and we're going to do this. But, you know, they gave me the space to kind of say why I thought, you know, I was right. And, and they disagreed. But I felt like I'd, you know, been heard or whatever. Um, and then on other stuff, I mean, I've been in a writer's room where it all kind of got a bit... I, I don't know, the thing, the, the project was changing wasn't quite what I thought it was. But... That was someone else's vision, so in the end, you have to put your hands and go, that's, that's not mine, and I'm, you know, it's not fair for me to push for something because I'm not the leader of this thing, and it might not be quite what I thought it was, but that's fine. Um, I think the most you can do is just is, is stick to your guns and, and as far as, you know, be polite and say, well, I actually feel this, that, and the other, um, but probably know when, you know, you haven't got the power to implement it and work up to a point in your career where you would have the power because you would be an EP on something or, you know, writer, director, control freak. So you would, you, you know, you can, sorry, no, but, you know, you, um, uh, but, but you want, you know, you, you can't have that control at the beginning. So I think you, what's great is if you can pick people who want to kind of help you with your vision, trust them because they're more experienced to tell you when you're probably wrong, um, but, but work up to a point where you do have more control and then you can say you can have your vision as purely as you... So I, I don't know if I... Bought no, no, that's a very good it. answer. I mean, I wondered if it was borne out by your experience that rather than saying, well, actually, here on an individual project, here is the right approach to, to making your voice heard as a writer, may, is it simply a question of saying, well, actually, you have to just pay your dues, essentially, and work up to a level professionally where you've had a few projects behind you which have achieved a certain amount commercially, critically, and then you will be able to get your voice heard? Um, I, I, you know, I think... Film is a is a creative medium that's a collaborative creative medium. I don't believe in the idea of the auteur because you can't hold all the the instruments and, and act and do everything. Um, so the first thing that I do is sort of look at myself and, and question my own ego, and I and I and I sort of have a system in place which I use every day when I'm working to make sure that I'm checking my own ego and that I'm not trying to do something just so I can be right or be the boss. Mm. Um, that said, so now I know that the decisions I make are decisions based on my gut instinct and a, and a rationality and are not about ego. Um, so when I come to something that I'm really insisting on, I think it's gone through a process of questioning that's quite rigorous. Also, the relationships I pick, the, the people that on a producing level we do business with, the people that, that, that are working on the team have been carefully selected. And I think that's the key. You know, if you're going to get into a bad relationship with someone and it's not going to work out, and you know that going into it, what do you expect is going to happen? Um, and then I think ultimately it comes down to a choice if, you know, the, the situation turns disastrous. Um, are you willing to accept it and continue, or are you willing to walk away? Where, what, what do you want out of life? What is your, how do you see your, your career? Wh why are you doing it? Um, for me, you know, I would, I would love to be a commercial filmmaker in, in this sense, and I, and I want to be. But ultimately, when it comes down to it, if the, the vision of the film is not the one I want to make, I will, I will walk away. Um, and if I don't own the project, then, OK, it's lost to me. And I have to accept that. I'm not willing to put my name on a film that I'm not happy with, but then I have to accept the consequences of that and what that may mean. So that's how I see it. Peter, I mean, having fulfilled many different roles within the creative process. Um, I mean, on a kind of creative level, anything that makes what you're trying to do better, work better, is wonderful. And, uh, you know, um, I, I, whether it's me contributing it or somebody else contributing it, doesn't make, to me, that doesn't make any difference. What I found, I mean, you know, in a way, McQueen was the first time that I was felt creatively fully responsible for a project or shared responsibility with Ian. Um, and, and Ian has directed before, and I hadn't. And 
I was really shocked at myself because I've kind of always been a fairly easygoing guy. And I, I found that I you know, became almost feral if I, <laughs> if I felt that something was in some way um, threatening to the, 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 the vision, the, the, what, what I felt we could achieve with it. Um, I lost a temper that I actually didn't really know I had. <laughs> you know. Um, I behaved very badly before, which I immediately apologised a couple of times. But I kind of think it was about protect. I really do genuinely think it was about protecting the film because there were, and, and what the issues were about were usually issues of, yeah, of, of, of money. We're running out of money. You, you know, you've got to finish. Um, at a, a, you've got to, your, here's your deadline to lock picture, and it's entirely unreasonable. And you are aware that you're not going to be able to to, to to lock it by that point, or whatever it was. Um, being told that you couldn't correct something that you. T tiny little things, but, but, but you, what happens is you become quite obsessed by detail. And again, that's something I, I didn't realise, I, I hadn't appreciated before. You become obsessed about um, the frame. You know, I didn't realise that. I mean, I don't know if that happened, must happen with you. You can just see it from your, your work. But, you know, you, 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 everything has to be right. And, and that, was a, that was shocking to sort of discover that. I, I, I found it quite addictive in a weird sort of way. <laughs> but also, I, I kind of thought, I, I couldn't do this. I couldn't do this for a living. Is that because, is that because the sort of the scale of the scale of the undertaking is so sort of vast, and there's so much of it which is uncontrollable that you end up thinking about the detail because you can feel like you can sort of kind of control the detail. You can control that frame. Is that why that happens? I think I think it does to some degree. I think it's I, I, I think really though it's not a control freak thing. It's a, it's it's not, it's going back to this is the experience that I want to have when I'm this is what the experience that I and I want the audience to have when they're watching the film. And if that if that line isn't delivered there, if that, whether it's a laugh or a shock or a moment of big emotion, if you haven't got the time to do that and you haven't got the time to explore the options to do it properly, you know, or um, uh, something, some outside force is in any way threatening that, that's when, when, when it becomes very tough. Yeah. I think to add to what Nigel said as well, I mean, I think you're absolutely right in that you, to know when to walk away and to know the consequence of staying on a project that you don't feel is what you thought it was mm -hmm. or leaving and just being realistic about that. And also, I think it's really important when you do disagree about something and checking your ego is really important. I think the, the golden rule is try not to be a dick. And, and like yes. gen genuinely, it's like if you just go, am I, am I being a dick? And, and you, you, if you are, then you just try not to be. And I think also if you... If you quite often show that you're willing to go, no, you're right, I'm, you know, and you're, you're trying to be as generous as possible, the time when you go, no, I really think this is right, people might be more likely to listen, whereas they'll just go, no, you're a megalomaniac. It, yeah. You know, so I, I, think, I think it's also, you want to be someone who's nice to work with because everyone has a, a better time. We've all worked with people who are difficult, and they might be brilliant, but most people would prefer to work with people who are generous and collaborative and could admit when they're wrong. So I think the more you can practice that as early as possible, even though it might kill you because you're convinced that you're right, it's good for everyone, I, th I think, you know. A mentor once told me, um, bitterness is the poison of the artist. And if you get that kind of festering bitterness inside you, it'll eat away at you and you won't be able to be creative and do your job. And, mm -hmm. I, and I really believe that. Like, you have to make your decisions and then let go of it. Don't hold grudges and things like that and just get on with your work and your creativity and move on to the next thing rather than kind of obsessing about someone messed you over or these things happen because it's life and you just, you got to get on and, and move forward. I'm going to stop monopolizing the conversation as much as I kind of want to. Um, if you have a question for any three of our panellists or all three of our panellists, please do raise your hand. I think we had one to start with. Um, talking about vision again at the sort of writing stage, um, do you have a very clear vision of kind of what the it's going to look like in terms of the set and locations and things, or do you have to write that sort of really long description, or do you kind of leave that open to later on? Um, so when I'm writing, there there's always sort of a couple of scenes that I pretty much direct them as I envision them when I'm writing. Um, so there was a specific scene with the arrival of um, an English officer in my film that the first draft of the script, and it really didn't change. And it, in my head, it was exactly as, as I shot it. But um, and other things obviously happen in the, in the moment. Obviously, a lot of the locations in my film came from living in the desert and discovering them with the Bedouin. And it's a very sort of organic develop, development process. I think, again, it depends on 
if you have the control. Um, so I, I write as much as I can in the stage directions, but I'm also aware that that may change depending on what the director feels about it. So it depends how collaborative it is at the stage of writing. Um, and for me, I mean, speaking about documentary, yes, there are certain things that when you're first envisioning it, um, that you, you kind of like thinking, what elements do I want to work with? You know you're going to work with different kinds of found footage, whether it's stills or motion archive. You know you're going to be shooting interviews. How do you want those interviews, in, interviews to, to feel and play on the screen? Which I know might sound ridiculous, but, you know, um, Ian uh, on, taught me a lot on McQueen about filming the interviews, that we, we went for very big close-ups or much wider shots, but not mid shots. Think, little things like that that you're you're thinking about as you prepare the the, the film and music, and uh, you, you kind of have a sense of, you know, there's always a capsule sequence, um, whether it's fiction or, or or which is the heart of the film for me or the reason that I'm mm. I'm doing it. Yeah, you try yeah, to yeah. get down. Do you raise a hand? I'll I'll make sure the microphone gets to you. So. Uh, here and, and then there. Hi. Um, how much attention do you pay to the structure when writing? Do you, are you traditional? Do you go off piste? How much do you let that interfere, if at all? What do you, what do you mean, the structure? Like when the, you're writing, like the, the form of the, you know, how you structure the writing itself in terms of... Um, I, I think... <laughs> I, I'm, I'm pretty chaotic, actually. I think I, I kind of, I like to, TV's easier because you, if you're writing for an end of part or a, an end of episode, you want your hook to be in place. So if you're writing an hour-long TV show, even if it's an hour for the BBC with no ads, it's still quite useful to go, we need to keep people hooked in, you know, for these quarters. Um, but I, I don't think I'm great in terms of, you know, the structure you read about in, in books. I tend to write, you know, some kind of, fairly loose thing, and then go back and work out if it's making sense in terms of arcs. So, yeah. Peter, because there is a lot of, again, if you read the books, it's all about structure. It's all you're just, as a writer, you're just supposed to sort of fill in the blanks. Uh, I had, yeah. I mean, we had a, a, one of the early cuts of McQueen, one of the producers, who said, where's the midpoint turn? And, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that, that kind of, the kind of jargony approach to structure <laughs> is absolutely anathema to me. But at the same time, you know, I, I love a well told story and I love that to me structure is about what happens next and keeping the audience you know kind of like there's a lovely you have to get that combination of unpredictability and expected and expectation um, when you're when when you're telling a film story I think um, and so structure is quite useful thinking where you are roughly in the story where where certain elements of the story have locked and can be developed beyond that or certain choices have been made so um, and I, I mean, I do love reading about structure, um, but a lot of it, I think, is unconscious, really. Um, one, one second for a very quick anecdote about this. I mean, I remember working on a, a, on a fiction film years and years ago and having a mentor on it in the company that we were working with who was very, very experienced and was working with Michael Mann on a, on a film. And Michael Mann's Bible is The Hero with a Thousand Faces, the Joseph Campbell book, which is about the kind of the monomyth, the one story that unites all stories, as it were. And I'd never read it. I'd never heard of it, actually. And, um, and, and River came up to me, uh, having read the draft, and said, I know you. You've read Joseph, your Joseph Campbell. And I said, who's Joseph Campbell? Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't have any sense of it. And I then found out a little bit about Campbell and realised, oh, my God, yes, I'm, you know, one way or another, this story is sort of doing each of the staging posts. That, that, that Campbell talks about. Um, and that was quite, uh, you know, that's why I think in a sense, if you start with somebody else's idea of what structure is and try and write to that, so if you take a Robert McKee or a Sid Field or whatever, I don't think you're gonna, I think you're, that's a, that becomes a prison. But I think having an awareness of structure and using, feel the force, as it were, um, uh, it, it can guide you um, and help you channel your unconscious thoughts. How about you, Nadia? I mean, how much of, of what you're doing is instinctive and how much of it is thinking, OK, it's, it's page 46, so therefore I have to be here? Um, so, the, I mean, there'll, there'll, be, there'll be moments very, at the very beginning of conceiving of the film where I know exactly where the, the, this moment has to occur, you know, so that there is a specific set piece in the centre of the next film, which is the reason why the film is being made based on a history of something that occurred. And... So the whole film is circling around that event. So I know that that's the case. And I know the end immediately as well. Um, 
so now I'm sort of playing around with getting there and moving around and making sure that everything is flowing in the same rhythm as we talked about before. Obviously, when you're dealing with genre, the structures of genres change. The timings of when um, an act break will occur or th something like that will, will move between whether you're in a film noir or you're in a western or you know, you're in a heist movie or, or what, what genre you're playing with. And, and there's, there's a language to that and there's traditions to that. So you know that on you know, 45 minutes into a film noir that you know, this is going to occur. Um, and that's pretty well established and you can go and, and find that. What I would encourage everyone to do, which I do, which I love, is to go deeper than that and look at the sort of the history of human storytelling. Look at uh, folklore traditions, fairy tale traditions. There's a lot of, lot of academic uh, work on those. Um, and uh, there's a lot of great books about that, which I absolutely love, about how we as human beings communicate. You know, especially uh, I love sort of the oral storytelling traditions. And you know, it's kind of like if you're a doctor, you know, filmmaker is a heart surgeon, but you know, you also you got to do your your medical stuff. You got to do your five years of medical school, and I and I think it's very interesting to look at how we communicate and the history of that, and, and I and I use that probably more than I use film uh, rigid film structure. So I'll, I'll analyze it. I'll use a fairy tale structure more than I will use a, mm. a film structure. Mm. I think that's that's great. I think there was, a, there was a question sort of midway around. That was it. Yes, just here. Um, you all spoke about um, the importance of being open to ideas and thinking about writing not just when you're sat at your desks. And I guess coming from that, then you'll have instances where you, you get an idea and you're kind of out and about and you can't necessarily start working straight away. So I wondered, with the gap between having that initial idea and then getting to a final script, what are the kind of first steps that you take if you have an idea and you think, this is brilliant, I need to do something with this? How do you go about preserving that? Do you start writing the second you get home? Like, What do you kind of do with that initial inspiration? I talk, voice notes on the phone is really useful. So if, you, if I've not got a notebook on me and I'm, if I get the idea and I'm walking, I'll just record a long message to myself. Um, some are better than others. I've listened back to the God, that's, that's a terrible idea, but at least you, you've got it. Um, and then, you know, the, keeping a notebook by the bedside is really helpful. And then I find I compile a big document of ideas and stuff and then, you know, they kind of get portioned off into different projects. And going back to an earlier point you made, Danny, I think I would only plunder another project if it had been something that I'd gone, I'm probably not going to write that. So I think if anything still feels like it's alive, try and keep it separate, and I wouldn't want to nick bits of it. But if I feel it's sort of dead, um, and like a, a carcass with some stuff I can pick out, then I would. But you know, otherwise, I'd leave it where it is. Uh, um. It just differs from, uh, I mean, I, I find I get a lot of inspiration. I mean, it's kind of a dreaming process, really. And I, I, I love just going out, going for walks, whether it's talking with somebody else about the project and so on, or, or even just listening to the music that you feel you're going to use and envisioning it in your head, just letting it play as a film in your head, in a sense, or extrapolating moments and things. And I certainly found... You know, we knew from a very early stage, for example, on McQueen, that we were going to be working with Michael Nyman and, and his extraordinary catalogue. And I would just... I, I mean, I don't think I listened to any other music but Michael Nyman for a two-month period. <laughs> and I just had this music playing and a building, building moments and sequences in, in my head. Um, notebooks. Um, Scrivener, I've always found, is a very useful piece of software um, because it allows you to collate... Um, notes, index cards, bits of research, all in one project file. And I, and I kind of quite like that. But then I love writing things in note form as well. And I often get completely lost. I know I've written that down somewhere and spend half a day sort of trying to locate whether it's on, on a phone or in a notebook or wherever. Um, there's a great line in, in Campion's uh, Bright Star where, where Keith says, poetry is like, uh, the experience of poetry is like luxuriating in a lake. And I love that process. So when I come up with the original idea and I've kind of done the research, I like to luxuriate mm -hmm. in the lake and just allow these ideas to play around in my head without really kind of talking about them. I don't like to let off the steam of talking about it. I like to play it privately like it's my secret kind of thing. And um, if it's the wrong idea or it's not really doing it for you, 
at that point, you'll probably drop it. And that's what usually happens with me is that it, you know, it sounded like a good idea, but for some reason, I'm really not connecting with it. I, I drop it. But then usually, if, if, if it's the film for you, it's, it, luxuriating starts to make it build. And it just gets louder and louder and more things happening. And you start getting ideas and you start flowing. And so it just, it just starts building all the time. Um, so I just like to sit with it in my own head and allow it to, to develop. Um, and that will tell you whether you should do it or not, I think. I think we've got time for, for one more question. I thought I was going to add it. Yes, here at the end. You were talking about certain books or articles that you read um, in your um, script writing journey. Do you have specific ones you recommend? For me? That stood out for you, yes. Um, Bruno Bettelheim, um, The Enchantment of Fairy Tales. Um, Levi Strauss was an academic who looks at folklore and fairy tales. Um, Maria, T I, I'm sorry if I get her name wrong, Maria, I think it's Tata or Tata. Uh, she's a professor at Cambridge, I think. Um, there's a lot, uh, <laughs> but I've forgotten them. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot about, um, there's one about forests and nature and how they're used in fairy tales, and I've forgotten the name of it. People will have to go and work yeah, that themselves. It'll be like a homework. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask one last question for people who are early in their career, which most people in the room will be. How much writing for free should people be prepared to do? Charlie. Well, I, th I don't know. I think if you, if you love the idea, you want to write it. So I think it depends. I think if it's a, an idea that's not your own, try not to write those. Because if you're going to write something for free, make sure it's something mm. that you love. Um, so I think it's probably, I would, it's probably better to be doing another job that pays money. Like I was doing lots of copywriting work um, to, make, to make money and then writing screenplays. Um, but I also find out who else is being paid. Like if, if no one's being paid, then it's fine. But if you're the only person who's not being paid, it's like when the actors are the only people who aren't paid on a, on a project. And you kind of go, well, if someone's making money somewhere, you should work out, you know, where you draw the line. So, but I think for your own stuff that you're passionate about that you need to write and have, because it's good to have spec scripts, and it's great to be able to present people with an idea rather than a Bible, go, here's the script. Um, that's kind of cool, I think. So, yeah. Yeah, Peter, how difficult is it to, to, to navigate that? Because you actually, you, obviously, you have to have writing samples. You have to have people, something that you can show people. Um, um, how many years do you devote to that process? Uh, well, I, I'm, just trying to, I'm just trying to remember, actually. I mean, I fell into getting commissioned work pretty quickly. Um, I have worked, I, I worked, used to work for Ken Russell, director, and um, I learnt, I mean, in a sense, he gave me more and more writing responsibilities on, on the films that we were doing, and, and that taught me a lot about the grammar and the mechanics of it. Um, and then I kind of came out of that process and uh, found that I not, didn't have a name, but people sort of trusted me. Um, I would say that for people starting out, I think the most important thing is... You know, if you're working, if you're doing work with four other people, I think if you're, and if you're being paid very little or nothing, the crucial thing is that that piece of work gets made. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're writing on somebody else's, um, writing for somebody else who's doing a short, that might be better than writing for someone else who's got a plan for a film that might happen in 10 years' time. So I would say that's, that's important um, to, to bear in mind because it's actually you only really start getting both a reputation and also really understanding the process when you see stuff translating from page to screen. Sure, it's Nadia, such... I was going to ask you about that distinction as well, which is, is it, is it, obviously you learn the craft to an extent before the money kicks in, but is it actually only when there is money attached to a project that it becomes something slightly different? So I, I got paid for the first time last year. That was, the, 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 my new project is the first time I've ever been paid to do what I do. Um, so that's, I started in 2003, so it's a long time. But I have done that by choice, and I've suffered the consequences of that by choice. As I said earlier in the talk, I, I feel like I made a mistake. I feel like I should have probably been a jobbing writer and developed like that. I think I've, I've lost in, in the sense of, of hands-on experience through doing that, probably because of my ego, because I just didn't want to work for someone else and, and have it be their project and, and you know, deliver to them. Um, so I would, uh, you know, f find meaningless jobs that didn't occupy my mind so that I could write. I used to, you know, 
something I, I, I love is that I, I used to lay dance floors and I laid, used to lay dance floors in the Grosvenor Hotel, which is where I danced when I won the BAFTA on that dance floor. So was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Victory. Um, Did you think when you were laying the floor, one day I'm going to dance? One day, <laughs> one day I will dance. That's like a, that's like a scene from a script. Yeah, it, it, was, it was it was very it was a beautiful moment, beautiful moment. Um, so I've obviously gone the crazy route that really was unnecessary. Um, I could have had commission jobs and, and done that, and I and I in hindsight I would have gone back and, and done that. The good thing is that I've been able to develop my my style freely. Um, I wrote five scripts that never got made, but that was my film school. Doing that, and the trial and error of that was what taught me how to write. The difficulty is when you come back into the industry and you've got your own style, suddenly you realize that your style and the way that you write is not the way they're used to receiving scripts. Mm -hmm. And that can be a problem. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not... Um, I'm too kind of detailed. I'm not too... You know, they, they try and make me thin out scripts, but I'm writing to direct. So selfishly, I don't care that it's a laborious read because I've got all this, that, that's my blueprint, a real blueprint, where, which a, a head of department can look at and take everything from. So I almost have to reverse it now and remove everything so that it can be read and financed and then kind of chuck everything. Back this, I'm not too sure about this process. I, don't, I, I have to develop a different technique of doing this now. But it's trial and error because it's my first time in the industry. So I was never part of the industry. I, I knew nothing about the industry. And I'm just learning it for the first time now. We're going to have to end out. I wish we didn't have to. Um, thank you to EE for, for their support. Thank you to the panel for an amazing degree of candor and insight, I think. Um, Nadi, Peter, Charlie, thank you.